The Sahara Desert in Africa is one of the driest places on Earth. Because of its dry conditions, fine sand particles from the desert can easily become airborne, leading to dust emissions that affect the global climate. However, between 11,000 and 5,000 years ago, this region experienced wetter conditions, known as the African Humid Period, causing reduced dust and a dramatic greening of the land. In the near future, human-induced climate change could dramatically alter rainfall patterns in the Sahara, causing reductions in dust emissions that may further impact the global climate. However, the Sahara wasn't always dry and dusty. During the early and middle Holocene, 11,000 to 5,000 years ago, the arid region transformed into grasslands with trees, lakes, and rivers. The evidence for this Saharan greening interval comes from several paleoclimate archives such as pollen found in sediments along with archaeological evidence indicating that humans once lived, hunted, and gathered deep within the current desert. The Holocene greening is the last of a sequence of African humid periods. These are caused by the gradual shift in the orientation of Earth's rotational axis which occurs in cycles lasting about 26,000 years. During periods in this cycle when the African summer sun is at its strongest, a larger temperature gradient forms between the land and sea. This increased gradient strengthens the African monsoon, bringing rainfall deeper into the Sahara. The current period of climate change caused by human emissions could significantly impact the African monsoon. Greenhouse gases trap the sun's radiation close to the Earth's surface. Land absorbs more radiation than water, heating up faster, again increasing the temperature difference between land and sea, which could strengthen the monsoon and bring increased rainfall to parts of the desert. Mineral dust emissions from the Sahara depend on dry conditions, so they're susceptible to changes in rainfall. Therefore, the climatic impact of future changes in dust emissions in the Sahara and the neighboring Sahel region could be felt worldwide. However, the impact of the greening of northern Africa and the African humid periods on the global climate is poorly understood. Scientists are particularly concerned about changes in rainfall patterns which could impact agricultural production and communities. It could also affect tropical cyclones, some of the deadliest weather hazards. Hypatia under Sahara Desert The origin of Hypatia can be traced back to when a red giant star in its death stage collapsed into a white dwarf star, stars with medium to high mass. After the collapse that would have taken place inside a gigantic dust cloud nebula, the white dwarf star found itself in a binary system with a second star orbiting a common center of mass. The hungry white dwarf star eventually ate the other star and at some point exploded, causing a supernova-type la explosion inside the nebula. At some point, it started hurling towards our planet, but the heat of entry into Earth's atmosphere, combined with the pressure of impact in the Great Sand Sea in southwestern Egypt, shattered Hypatia's parent rock. The movement of tectonic plates that created the Mediterranean Sea and the Alps also sparked the drying of the Sahara some 7 million years ago, according to the latest computer simulations of Earth's ancient climate. Though North Africa is currently covered by the world's largest non-polar desert, climate conditions in the region have not been constant there for the last several million years. Subtle changes in Earth's tilt toward the Sun periodically increase the amount of solar energy received by the Northern Hemisphere in summer, altering atmospheric currents and, and driving monsoon rains. North Africa also sees more precipitation when less of the planet's water is locked up in ice. Such increases in moisture limit how far the Sahara can spread and can even spark times of the Green Sahara, when the sparse desert is replaced by abundant lakes, plants, and animals. History Before the Great Desert was born, North Africa had a moister, semi-arid climate. A few lines of evidence, including ancient dune deposits found in Chad, had hinted that the arid Sahara may have existed 
at least 7 million years ago. But without a mechanism to explain how it emerged, few scientists thought that the desert we see today could really be that old. Instead, most scientists argue that the Sahara took shape just 2 to 3 million years ago. Terrestrial and marine evidence suggest that North Africa underwent a period of drying at that time when the Northern Hemisphere started at its most recent cycle of glaciation. Research Now Zongji Zhang of the Jerknes Center for Climate Research in Bergen, Norway and colleagues have run simulations of climate change in North Africa over the last 30 million years. Their simulations take into account changes in Earth's orbital position, atmospheric chemistry, and the ratio of land to ocean as driven by tectonic forces. The models show that precipitation in North Africa declined by more than half about 7 million years ago, causing the region to dry out. But this effect could not be explained by changes in vegetation, Earth's tilt, or greenhouse gas concentrations leaving tectonic action. About 250 million years ago, a huge body of water called the Tethys Sea separated the supercontinents of Laurasia to the north and Gondwana to the south. As those supercontinents broke apart and shuffled around, the African plate collided with the Eurasian plate, birthing the Alps and the Himalayas but closing off the bulk of the Tethys Sea. As the plates kept moving, the sea continued to shrink, eventually diminishing into the Mediterranean. What set off the aridification in Africa was the replacement of the western arm of the Tethys Sea with the Arabian Peninsula around 7 to 11 million years ago. Replacing water with land, which reflects less sunlight, altered the region's precipitation patterns. This created the desert and heightened its sensitivity to changes in Earth's tilt, the researchers conclude in a study published today in Nature. The emergence of the Sahara 7 million years ago would have affected the plants and animals in the region and possibly the early ancestors of human beings. For instance, Sahelanthropus chedensis, which may be the earliest member in the human family tree, lived just to the south of the Sahara in what is now northern Chad around the time of the transition. Overall, the team writes, the study adds to evidence that changes in precipitation were fundamental to the evolution and dispersal of hominins in North Africa. In the spring of 2020, an amazing relic was discovered in a remote region of the Sahara Desert, an ultra-rare chunk of an embryonic planet that existed before Earth was born. Known as Urchech 002 EC002, the meteorite was forged within the crust of an ancient protoplanet, a small celestial body that serves as a building block for planets. The volcanic space rock is the oldest known lava that has ever fallen to Earth and offers an unprecedented glimpse of planetary formation in the early solar system, according to a study published on Monday in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Scientists led by Jean-Alice Barat, a professor of geochemistry at the University of Western Brittany in France, jumped at the opportunity to examine this extraordinary time capsule from the infancy of the solar system, which belongs to the Andesitic family of volcanic rocks and is unlike anything that has been seen before. One of the scientists said, When we saw the first descriptions of this rock, it was really obvious that this rock was unusual. The age was not the sole point of interest. We were extremely interested by the genesis of such extraterrestrial and acidic melts and on the processes of formation of primordial crusts. Such samples are extremely precious. The stones which contain stunning crystals were found in May 2020, but early erosion of the extraterrestrial rocks suggests that they fell in the desert much earlier. It's not a meteorite freshly fallen on Earth. It's slightly weathered, but we know since the study of the Tatooine meteorite that terrestrial weathering is fast even in the Sahara. After procuring samples of the meteorite, Barat and his colleagues were able to pin down when this piece of protoplanet crust, 
which was partially melted as lava crystallized into a solid form. Farming on the Moon Scientists at the University of Florida have managed to grow plants in lunar soil, a first step for farming on the moon if and when humans plan an extended lunar stay. Although plants grown in lunar soil are not as robust as those grown in earthen soil, the team is hoping to figure out a way to grow more nutrient-rich plants on the moon by studying how these plants respond to lunar samples. For their experiments, scientists use Arabidopsis thaliana, which is used as a model organism for research into all areas of plant biology. Due to its small size and ease of growth, native to Eurasia and Africa, it's a distant relative of mustard greens and other cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. Using samples collected during the Apollo 11, 12, and 17 missions, the team sowed seeds in trays with one gram of regolith lunar dust for each plant. The trays stored inside terrarium boxes were kept in a clean room where they were given water and a nutrient solution daily. And just two days later, the Arabidopsis taliana started to sprout. Read more. Nighttime solar power. In a major breakthrough, researchers from the University of New South Wales have managed to produce electricity from nighttime solar power, the heat radiated by Earth at night. Solar power warms up the planet during the day in the form of sunlight, and at night, this same energy radiates back into the vast cold void of outer space in the form of infrared light. It was by harnessing the emission of this infrared light using a semiconductor device called a thermoradiative diode composed of materials found in night vision goggles that researchers were able to generate power. Although the amount of power generated at this stage is very small, around 100,000 times less than that supplied by a solar panel, researchers believe that this is just the beginning and that there's a scope for improvement. Ancient Humans South Asian Link Scientists have discovered an ancient motor they believe belongs to a young Denisovan girl who lived about 164,000 years ago in a cave what is now Laos, according to a new study. This discovery is evidence that ancient humans, previously known only to dwell in caves in Siberia and China, also lived in Southeast Asia. The study shows that Denisovans, a group of humans that went extinct around 20,000 years ago, lived in a wide range of environments and latitude and were able to adapt to extreme conditions ranging from the cold mountains of Russia and Tibet to the tropical forests of Southeast Asia. So far, researchers have discovered only five Denisovan fossils, three upper motors, a finger bone, and a jawbone. This is why there is very little known or understood about them. Past research shows that ancestors of modern humans split about 700,000 years ago from the lineage that gave rise to Neanderthals and Denisovans. However, genetic analysis of fossils of these extinct lineages reveal that the possibility of them having interbreed with modern humans cannot be ruled out. The exact places where Denisovans may have lived is also a subject of heated debate since all of their fossils found so far have been traced to mainland Asia, but genetic research suggests that populations in Oceania and Southeast Asian islands too may have Denisovan roots. The Sounds of Aurora Researchers at Finland's Aalto University have been studying auroral sounds for many years. Their recordings of sounds made by the Aurora Borealis Northern Lights have revealed that this phenomenon is much more common than was believed earlier and occurs even in the absence of visible Northern Lights. In 2016, the team was able to link recordings of crackling and popping sounds during an auroral event with temperature profiles. The data demonstrated that these lights are sometimes associated with sounds which result from electrical discharges across a temperature inversion layer about 70 meters above the ground. Temperature inversion layers are areas where the air above the ground is warmer than the air below it. Researchers recorded these sounds at night when no northern lights were visible. Then they compared the recordings with measurements of geomagnetic activity 
and found that a strong correlation was evident since the 60 best candidate sounds in terms of data quality were all linked with changes in the geomagnetic field. These recordings show that auroral sounds occur even in the absence of visible northern lights, which means that the phenomenon is more common than was believed earlier.